Welcome to the National Press Foundation. We're coming to you from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios via Zoom. I'm Chris Adams, Director of Training for NPF. Today, we're continuing our series on understanding global trade. It's the third of 10 that will explore how trade alliances and supply chains are shifting, how trade enforcers are trying to maintain fairness, and how workers and consumers are affected by it all. We're thankful for our sponsor, the Heinrich Foundation, an Asia-based philanthropic organization that works to advance sustainable global trade. We also have some news on our journalism awards. The winners of our recent round of awards for coverage of poverty and inequality were MedPage Today, the Mountain State Spotlight in West Virginia, and the California Divide Collaborative, uh, which includes Cal Matters, the Salinas Californian, and the Mercury News. We'll have another round of these awards later this spring, so watch for details at nationalpress.org. On our website, you can also see the winners of the Heinrich Foundation Award for Distinguished Reporting on Trade. A team from the Washington Post won for stories that brought to light the complexities of doing business in China, something we'll be talking about today as well. Today, we're thrilled to have with us four experts to talk about COVID and medical supply chain issues. Our guests are Meredith Broadbent, a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a former chair of the U.S. International Trade Commission. She recently authored a report on COVID and medical supply chain issues. Martha Mendoza is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner for the Associated Press, who last year wrote and co-produced a special report for the AP and Frontline, America's Medical Supply Crisis. Fiona Miller is director of the Center for Sustainable Health Systems at the University of Toronto, who wrote for BMJ Quality and Safety about the vulnerability of the medical supply chain. And Willie Shi is a professor of management practice at the Harvard Business School, who recently wrote, is it time to rethink globalized supply chains? We'll hear from each of the panelists and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. You can raise your Zoom hand or put a question into the Q&A text function. And please tweet today at hashtag NPF trade. So welcome all and welcome to our speakers and thank you for taking the time to come talk with us and talk with our fellows. Um, we're looking to have a good discussion. Um, and so if you are out there and you want to ask one of these spe speakers specifically or all of them generally some questions, you can, as I said, you can put those into chat or you can raise your hand and I'll call on some of you to ask an audio question. But for the kind of the opener, the, um, the opening uh, speaker, I want to turn to Meredith Broadbent, who recently wrote about the, the demand problems that came about because, because of COVID and what might be a way out of that. So uh, Meredith Broadbent, I'll turn it over to you. Um, we'll hear from you for kind of the big picture overview of that. And then we will go on to Fiona Miller, then Willie Shi and Martha Mendoza. And uh, then we'll come back and have questions for all of them. So let me turn it over to you, Meredith. Thanks, Chris. It's great to, to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we began our CSIS project in August by convening a group of in interested thought leaders and industry representatives to assess how the US medical industrial base was responding to the emergency caused by pandemic related spikes in demand. At the time, there was widespread dire concern in Congress and the general public about shortages of pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and personal protective equipment, and a general angst that the US industrial, that US industrial supply chains were failing and that the US industry lacked the ability to produce at the scale necessary to meet demand caused by COVID. There must have been about 50 or 60 bills introduced in Congress on the topic. Our top line conclusion is, is that autarky and government mandates that manufacturing production return to the United States will only induce higher prices and, and more shortages. Instead, we propose a trusted, what we call a trusted supplier network of chosen countries with whom the United States would develop enhanced supply relationships. Overall, a uh, few observations, we expect that threats to supply chain resiliency will only increase in the future. Uh, the frequency of production and supply chain disruptions will continue for many reasons, such as pandemics, but will include weather, shipping, labor disruptions, and political instability. McKinsey estimates that companies can now expect supply chain disruptions lasting uh, one, or one month or longer to, to occur about every 3.7 years. A McKinsey survey in 2020 found that 93% of supply chain executives in the private sector 
are planning to take measures to make their supply chains more resilient, increase redundancy, nearshoring, and regionalizing their supply chain. McKinsey estimates that 38 to 60 percent of the pharmaceutical value chain could possibly regionalize in the coming years. Overall, we observe that companies are moving production and adjusting to the new threats of possible disruptions, although we don't have a measure of this yet. In terms of CSIS recommendations, we believe that Congress and the Biden administration should work together to enact a policy on medical supply chain security centered around diversification within a network of trusted supplier companies that cooperate with the US in order to bolster and guarantee a steady supply of essential medical products for future public health crises. The trusted partner network would offer, a mem offer member countries enhanced commercial ties, reciprocal reduction of trade barriers, investment, and other regulatory barriers, and a commitment of support from other trusted partner countries, especially during public health crises. Eligibility for cr criteria for the trusted partner status could include commitments to safety and efficacy of medical products, IP protection, and free data flows. All partners would commit to enhance supply chain visibility, work towards a new plurilateral trade agreement for the medical sector, exemplify trust and reliability, and commit to reciprocal support for supply chain security by prioritizing the flow of goods and information sharing during crises. We suggest several passable structures for the trusted partner network, including reciprocal negotiations with interested trading partner countries or a unilateral designation of countries eligible for the network, which would be similar to the US GSP program. As I said at, at the outset, we conclude that wholesale government mandated reshoring is, is really the wrong approach. OECD models indicate that wholesale reshoring would not improve resiliency or efficiency of supply, largely due to a lack of diversification and an inability to tap into global networks of suppliers and producers. And this was borne out in our case studies of Gilead, Pfizer, PPE, and ventilator production in the US, where we looked at how the US industry responded more at a firm level. Our first case study on Gilead, uh, their experience with ramping up production of Rendesifir through its supply chain and global manufacturing network illustrates how a company was able to respond to anticipated supply chain disruptions and spikes in demand by adjusting sourcing and improving manufacturing processes, shifting production among global facilities, and repurposing and ramping up facilities in the United States. But by supplementing domestic manufacturing with multiple international partnerships, Gilead created a sophisticated network of capable, of capable of producing large volumes of Rendesivir to meet huge domestic demand, as well as demand in global markets. Similarly, Pfizer's success with a COVID-19 vaccine was defined by its ability to mobilize global research, its, its large manufacturing footprint and its international network, which included an essential scientific and commercial collaborator BioNTech in Europe. Basically, Pfizer constructed two parallel supply chains, one in the US and one in Europe, to ensure scalability and redundancy. In contrast, the story for the national uh, strategic stockpile for PPE was not uh, as positive. It was depleted early on in the pandemic, and shortages of mask, gowns, and gloves became apparent and painful. Supply chains for certain PPE were strained due to the overwhelming size of demand spikes and insufficient production in the Western Hemisphere. Looking at ventilators, on the other hand, despite de delays, global supply lines for ventilators did remain intact. Ventilator manufacturers, aided actually by automobile, automobile companies and others, were able to greatly scale up production, retool factories, and ultimately identify new, new global domestic suppliers for component parts that were in shortage. So in conclusion, we see that the dire circumstances of the pandemic present a new opportunity for the United States to reinvigorate trade relations with allies, free trade agreement partners, and trusted supplier countries in the form of a, a trusted partner network. Thanks. Okay, so thanks. I, I have some, <clears throat> I'll have some very specific questions about the trusted partner network and how it would work. Um, 
But for, for now, I just want to ask one kind of really big picture question before we move on to Fiona Miller. Um, you noted in the report that um, the pandemic proved that no single country can produce all that it needs to fight COVID-19, let alone cure it. I'm just curious, who comes closest? I mean, are, are there countries out there that are able to supply much of, or most of what they need? And if we're dependent on China for so much um, and other countries, who is China dependent on? You know, Chris, I don't think any country is even close. I mean, I, I, I would say China produces a lot of products, but they're very, you know, dependent on us for certain products as well. So uh, there is a, an interdependence of mutual, uh, mutual dependence. Um, and I think uh, overall, our report talks about kind of taking a strategic approach, having the White House have a, a task force to, to pick the particular products that they view as most essential to health security, and then to figure out where those products are made, who is it a you know is it a, a trusted partner that might be making them or is it a country that we might have more friction with um and differentiating in that way but i just don't think there's i don't i wouldn't say china is self-sufficient i did, haven't looked at china in particular but i would be very surprised if that was true okay well thanks and we'll we'll come back to you for more questions in a bit um, but now we'll turn to fiona miller um, Fiona, you know, you've talked about how this becomes a kind of a moment to start having a policy discussion about how to handle all this. So I was hoping you could <clears throat> tell us about that and we'll hear from you now. Great, thank you. Yes, can you hear, do you see my screen? Yes, we can and we can hear you fine. Thanks very much for that. That was a great uh, uh, first uh, go at this. So I wanna talk about this very much from a policy perspective, um, but I also wanna talk about it principally from the health policy perspective. A lot of our discussions center on firms uh, and their supply chains. A lot of the supply chain manager literature, management literature is focused on that, but there are some very particular issues when you're standing um, within a health system, within a healthcare provider organization. Uh, but the most of what I really wanna say here is that we're dealing with uh, a very old problem that's been made, um, uh, that's been called attention to. COVID-19 has made it very difficult for us to ignore longstanding problems and has made some of them more acute, certainly. Um, but what's new isn't so much the nature of the problem. What's new are, are some of the solutions that are being proposed. And I think they include, but, but go beyond uh, some of what Meredith's talking about. So first of all, the, the fact that this, these are old problems. Um, and I don't wanna talk about this in great detail. My colleagues can do this, but just to sort of identify the two key ways in which from a health systems perspective, um, critical supplies may be unavailable. And this can occur in healthcare and beyond healthcare. The products may not be made um, in healthcare. Some of the key examples of that would be when Puerto Rico's, uh, what Puerto Rico faced uh, significant hurricanes in 2017 um, and Baxter's plants making uh, sterile saline uh, became critically unavailable in the US. Uh, but there had been chronic shortages prior to that. And that's when you have concentrated manufacturing in one place. You may have limited numbers of manufacturers so when one goes down or one take goes out of business, uh, you have a critical shortage. So that's what's happened with propofol about 10 years ago, which is a critical input into anesthetic practices. Or you may have a lack of the inputs. The manufacturing may be there, but we may not have what we need to actually make the final product. So we've seen that a lot with uh, within the COVID-19 era, um, particularly with polypropylene, melt-blown, non-woven variety, which is needed for masks and respirators. You don't have that material. You don't even have the machines to make that material. So those... These can all mean that we don't, the products can't be made in sufficient supply. Um, but beyond that, it's risks to them becoming available where they're needed. So they may exist, but they, they don't move. Uh, and a key issue that we've seen during the COVID-19 era, but also before it, are restrictions on mobility. Uh, so certainly export bans, uh, authorizations being required, commercial flights going down, or the, the challenge of, of global freight. Uh, very important area or issue in healthcare, which is a regulated health sector, importantly, is when the products don't meet regulatory specifications, uh, but they exist, but they still can't be used, or there may not be the regulatory infrastructure to actually certify, test, and assure their safety and, and efficacy. Or it can really be that the buyer 
is not looking at the supply chain, is not looking at the availability with a, a, a sufficiently long-term view. So all of these are issues that have happened in healthcare and beyond. We've seen them in the COVID era, but we've seen them otherwise. So, so my point being, yes, COVID-19 made uh, these kinds of long-standing problems more acute because in addition to supply challenges, we had, as Meredith pointed out, a massive acceleration in demand, uh, but, they, but, they're, but the shortages that are listed on the FDA's website the CARES, Act, the CARES Act gave us insight for the first time into uh, shortages on the device side, certainly related to public health uh, supplies related to the, to the pandemic. And so there are listed shortages uh, for ventilators, uh, for some of the personal protective equipment, and also for testing supplies. But the long-standing visibility we've had into drug shortages uh, shows that there's about 145 drugs listed, 20 or 30 of which are resolved. So well over 100 drugs that are in short supply in the US today, um, and many of those are not COVID related. So these are, these are longstanding problems. What's new though, is we're starting to have very interesting conversations uh, about uh, industrial policy, about a reinvigorated approach to, to ensuring the security of supply. And it very much is about these issues of, uh, of national security, but it goes beyond that and entertains uh, these questions about climate change and environmental uh, issues, about labor standards, uh, and about economic opportunity, including um, for communities that uh, are not getting the opportunities they should get. So um, uh, President Biden's um, recent executive orders are, I think, really illustrative of this. So the, the one in January, which is focused on the COVID-related public health supplies, um, does gesture in the direction uh, very clearly of, of uh, investigating and thinking through in a long-term strategy domestic manufacture. The more recent one that's more expansive in many, many ways because it goes across six sectors. It has a short-term 100-day focus uh, narrowly on things like rare earths um, and semiconductors and also active pharmaceutical ingredients, but it has a long-term strategic imperative that goes across six sectors. So agriculture and food, information communication technologies, transportation, uh, energy, and also uh, medical. And here the issue is security, national security, but also uh, being cognizant of the climate crisis and that's going to disrupt supply and thinking about the challenge of forced labor. Uh, there's a lot of uh, child labor and uh, modern slavery in the medical supply chain now. So how does that get dealt with? And thinking about opportunity to, to uh, strengthen domestic manufacturing uh, and, and in also provide access to uh, communities that have been left behind to economic opportunity. So there's a lot of policy goals that are being identified here. And none of this is about autarky. This isn't uh, one extreme or the other. This isn't sort of wide open borders, which really don't exist. Um, um, with, uh, nor is it about complete self-sufficiency, but it is about active efforts to identify strategic sectors that need and will need organized effort uh, to coordinate the ecosystems that can ensure um, um, domestic capacity and resilient supply and meet these other policy expectations that we have and should have in terms of environmental benefits, uh, labor and social standards and economic opportunity. So that's, that's what we're seeing and th that's what I think is so exciting. Uh, the Europeans have in different ways, some similar ideas, their pharmaceutical strategy has some elements of relocalization, definitely has elements of environmental performance. Um, and very interestingly, I think, uh, separately from the pharmaceuticals are at last week's um, adoption of a, a provisional text from the European Parliament. So with the direction to the commission to come back with legislation later this year around quite expansive expectations of corporate due diligence and corporate accountability. So there may be a relocalization, but there's certainly attention to globalized supply networks having to meet environmental and labor standards. So these are the conversations that are shifting in important ways. So far though, I've talked about the rich world uh, and, and um, we also need to think about uh, shifts in policy, which are less uh, appealing uh, to the US, uh, to Canada, my own country, to, to Europe, but uh, need to also be part of, uh, of uh, rethinking our, our policy directions going forward. So uh, as you know, most rich countries, I mean, the US is ahead of the game, you'll have your population vaccinated by, you know, uh, July 4th, right? Um, and, and you'll be free to go. We'll, in Canada, we're going to take longer, but the rich world is going to have its populations vaccinated by 20, the end of 2021. 
But the developing world uh, is unlikely to see uh, population vaccination until 2023, 2024. Uh, and there is a, a, an artificial scarcity of vaccine supply, despite the fact that there's been an enormous public investment in the research, enormous public investment in the advanced manufacturing commitments that allowed companies to gear up their manufacturing capacity. But there has not been a relaxation of, of overly strict intellectual property rules that disallow the use of existing manufacturing capacity in Senegal, additional capacity in India, in Egypt, in South Africa. So South Africa and India have led the charge at the World Trade Organization back in October and continuing, and the WTO is, is uh, sort of at a stalemate in what to do with it. And this is a call uh, for a significant waiver, temporary waiver, on COVID related um, products, uh, tests, vaccines, treatments, uh, for a waiver on IP rights, both patents, and it goes beyond patents to these um, um, cell lines uh, and, uh, and, and knowledge, uh, tacit knowledge uh, that would have to be reverse engineered in order for the, the capacity that exists in Senegal, for example, to, to start to manufacture their own vaccines. But the argument here is, uh, we, we can't just rely on um, donating money. Um, the COVAX uh, machine, which is intended to supply the Global South, uh, depends largely on the donations of funds and the donations of doses. But we actually need to ensure domestic manufacturing capacity so that there can be trusted networks of capacity and supply uh, in the developing world. And I'll leave it at that. OK, so we'll come back to some more questions. Um, uh, for you uh, after we hear the next two speakers. But next, I want to go to a Willie Shee, um, who is at the Harvard Business School and who is has, has done some work on medical supply chain issues, but is looking more broadly at other supply chain issues and how things have changed in the last year. So I was hoping you could address that now, uh, Willie. Yes, uh, thanks, Chris. And what I wanted to do is just, uh, I, I was trying to come up with like one or two pictures that were really describe kind of the fix that we find ourselves globally yeah, in a lot of supply chains around the world. And what I did is I drew this kind of generic supply chain, which starts all the way from raw materials, uh, which come to a factory. Now, maybe it's a formulator for a pharmaceutical ingredient, or, or it may be somebody who makes ventilators and maybe somebody who makes something else. Okay, and then you, you find uh, uh, links, uh, uh, of global links these days, uh, especially for things like pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical ingredients, medical devices, a whole host of devices to distribution, ultimately uh, going to uh, the point of consumption. And what you find in the structure of all these supply chains is uh, a tiering. I describe it as a tiering where I might have a uh, uh, prime assembler. You know, I might have as my first tier supplier who will in turn rely on a second tier to provide components or subassemblies or what have you. And each one of those will then rely on uh, people further down in the tier. Why do we have a structure like that today? It's because of specialization. It's because technology is so complex these days uh, that we need specialists who are going to make one component or another. Good example is if you look inside a notebook computer, somebody who will assemble a notebook computer, say for Dell, it would be a Chinese company who will then rely on a whole range of companies to supply uh, the microprocessor, the display screen, the, uh, uh, the keyboard, and so on. And each one of those will uh, trickle down in turn. What you find in these complex supply chains, a lot of specialization, a lot of focus on cost. Okay. And uh, uh, it, it's because of technological complexity and the desire to uh, go for larger scale. Now, when people started deploying these global supply chains over the last 30 years, but really the offshoring movement really got going in the early 2000s uh, with China's accession to the WTO. And, you know, uh, for example, like in uh, garment manufacturer and PPE, a lot of that was also uh, uh, the ending of the multi-fiber agreement. Okay, so those things all forced everybody to go look for lower cost. Okay, and it was actually a relatively benign trading environment if you look at the last 30 years where we've seen declining barriers, declining trade. So what people assumed is they could count on all these logistics arrangements to move goods around the world uh, at relatively low cost and very reliably. Okay, so now if you take a picture of what happened in 2000, uh, uh, 2020 
to today, right? We, we saw SARS-CoV-2 appear in China, the Lunar New Year shutdown, China starts to reopening, you know, but meanwhile, follow that with US-Europe uh, shutdowns. What we found is so many suppliers were so heavily dependent on China that we initially had a supply shock, which was then followed by, uh, if you look at one year ago now, uh, Europe shutting down, the US shutting down. So then there was a demand shock where a lot of people canceled their orders, okay? And if you look at industries, for example, like automotive, for example, uh, you see uh, in, in uh, Europe in March, car sales dropped 85%, okay? So then after that, uh, people said, well, maybe I don't wanna build as many cars. Everybody's worried about su supply uh, and worried about survival. And they were worried about how do I conserve cash? So let me cut down all my supplies. Meanwhile, what we did is we shut down international air travel, right? So we had 50% loss of air cargo capacity, which was very important, especially vis-a-vis -vis PPE in these days. Okay, so then uh, over that time, we had a lot of the ocean carriers who are uh, critical links in many of these supply chains blank their sailings, which means we're gonna cancel these sailings because there was no commerce going on. If you remember starting about a year ago, right? It was really supply shock meets demand shock, everything shut down. Okay, what happened? Starting in August, well, we had this gradual reopening. You see second waves of reinfection, but you see this massive restocking, uh, you know, new work from home demand, e-commerce demand. Okay, so what we've had as a consequence of that, we've seen uh, on the West Coast of the US, especially, but also New York and New Jersey more recently, this import surge, which has led to uh, port congestion uh, premium services, all kinds of challenges for every supply chain out there. And, and that's the big story today. Every day you see shortages in one industry or the other, right? And it's, it's the result of this, I'm going to depend on logistics. I'm going to depend on uh, a, a global dis, uh, geographic distribution to chase after the best cost and most specialization. Okay. And that's, that's the mess we get in today. Now, and you go back and say, well, you know, for if I'm looking at pharmaceuticals or things like that, you know, some of these supply chains are pretty, uh, pretty complicated, right? Where you'll have maybe somebody formulating in a Western country like the US or Western Europe, who will then rely on key ingredients from India, who will then rely on active pharmaceutical ingredients from China primarily. Okay. And in fact, some of those components may come from somewhere like uh, some of the ones we've traced they'll go back to uh, Holland or they'll go back to uh, Germany for some of those components. So you have this complex internet, uh, inter inter interdependent network that in the past year, we've basically thrown sand in the works and that's what we're seeing today. So that's just kind of a quick uh, overview of some of the challenges we're seeing. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And we're going to hear from, we'll be back uh, for some more questions for, for Willie Shi in a bit also, but we're going to hear now from Mar Martha Mendoza, who is a two-time Pulitzer winner um, and who last year, both for the AP and for Frontline, did a fascinating look at medical supply chain shortfalls and how the medical supply chain broke and what it meant for, for patients around uh, in the US and around the world. So Martha is going to tell us how she executed that package and uh, then we will have questions for her about the kind of the journalism as well. So Martha, welcome. Good morning and thanks Meredith, Fiona and Willie. You are exactly who I'm curious about hearing your perspectives on these items as we've been doing journalism and um, some of what you're talking about is exactly what we're seeing. Today for our journalists joining us, I'll be sharing a couple basic tools that we use to quantify some of the exact things Willie in particular was just speaking about how supply plummeted and then has shot up, and also um, some of the domestic manufacturing problems that we have seen. So let me share screen here. In At the very beginning of last year, which seems like a decade ago, my colleague Juliet and I were looking at doing a story about supply chains of a very different business, not medical supply chains, and we hope to still do that project someday. Um, prior to this, I had done a lot of supply chain reporting on um, seafood, textiles, et cetera. And so it seemed like it was time maybe to get going because there was a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of sorting out what's true and what's not. Um, and the question we asked ourselves are, are healthcare providers actually running out of supplies? And if so, why? 
it was rather shocking. There was, as I say, lots of misinformation. Um, there were obvious frontline shortages. And we, as journalists, had a big challenge, which is typically we would just go to the hospitals and knock on the door and ask, do you have shortages? But because we ourselves were sheltering in place and facing travel bans, we had to um, use other tools and, and tricks to get there. And then in telling our stories, we didn't wanna write anything about medical supply chains. We wanted to write about the people impacted by this. Um, cases just kept going up. We all learned to study these dashboards, but in the halls of hospitals, nurses were being handed hefty bags and being told to sew bandanas around their faces. We started with a federal procurement data system. If you haven't looked at this data, I recommend you do. It's fpds.gov. And this is where government spending can be tracked. And so we began looking at the COVID-19 spending. What were they buying? And what we found is that they were not buying masks, swabs, syringes, needles. There's no spending going out on this. There was no increase. And this was in March, April. Um, the federal government simply wasn't buying this stuff when other countries were. Um, gloves, gowns, just wasn't there. So then we began looking at imports and there's two great tools for doing this, Import Genius and Pangeva, which is owned by S&P Global. And these two companies basically take, anytime you send a package overseas, you're gonna fill out a customs bill of lading at the post office. And these companies are just tracking those, compiling those, aggregating those, and selling that data to importers and exporters. And they will with, work with journalists um, who, don't, who want that data as well. And so we began asking very basic questions. Um, how many shipments of N95s, surgical gowns, hand sanitizer, swabs, were imported in the US and we were looking year on year. So how about from mid-February to mid-March 2019 versus mid-February to mid-March 2020? And I'll, I'm not going to demo this, Willie, but if you spend some time looking at this data, we sure see that massive spike in August and really the arrivals come by September and then it just plummets off. I'm giving you a demo of Pangeva here just so you journalists can see how simple this tool is. is you type in the name of the item you're interested in and it's what country it's going to the United States and you're looking for import records, you punch in your dates and then you get your number of shipments. The volume is actually the shipping containers and you can see the, what countries are coming from over time. And even better, it tells you where the goods are shipped to, what company bought them and often what brand is on them. So this can be a really helpful tool for journalists. Um, with the N95s, we could see that, for example, in March 2019, there were 13 shipments or 24 shipping containers that arrived at US ports. In March 2020, when you may recall, the US was plunging into pure crisis, particularly New York, um, but also parts of the Northwest, there were three shipments of N95s arriving in the US, six shipping containers. And that drop, um, created a huge supply chain problem in the United States that continues today. Um, I will, at the end of this, get into whether there's actually shortages of N95s, which there are not. Um, there's a glut of N95s in, in this country right now. But the next question that came along for us, because then we've tracked N95s as they began arriving at US shores, and how much of these were counterfeits? Today, the estimate is 60% of masks are counterfeit. And that's not just N95s, it's also the surgical ones. Um, so we were studying the counterfeit warnings on the CDC and we were studying the arrivals of masks. Um, and we realized we were seeing ear loops which were specifically identified as counter, a, a, a counterfeit on an N95. We use Google images to track the web for more of these specific counterfeits. And then we tracked down the US buyers who had bought these counterfeit masks, asked them for their receipts and purchase orders. And we got colleagues in China to visit the address that all of these counterfeits that we were spotting this specific brand were coming from. So it was these Shanghai Dasheng masks that we saw arrive. They were the first to come in an air freight delivery after COVID had hit the US in LAX. And we watched them arrive, we watched them unbox them, and then we watched them stretch out the ear loops and thought, 
oh my God, those match the CDC counterfeits. Um, and so when our colleague went to Shanghai Dasheng factory where these were coming from, the sidewalk was lined with vendors and contracts selling these to US or any buyer. Actually, there were a lot of brokers out there. Um, since then, the counterfeits have soared. Next question we had was when the vaccine is ready, will the US be ready? And the answer has sadly been no. And I don't know why we were not orchestrating all types of rehearsals and apologies to you, Fiona. I know that the rollout of the vaccine is even more troubling in Canada, but we should have been practicing this in September, how to get our vaccines, I believe. Um, there was plenty of whistleblowers, including Rick Bright saying there's not gonna be enough needles and syringes. We went back to that federal procurement data system and we didn't see any needle and syringe contracts. The largest needle and syringe makers in the US were selling to Canada, Germany, and Europe, not the US. And Operation Warp Speed invested its largest contracts for unknowns in the injection system. They tapped us a, a company that told us themselves they should be the backup, not the first. That is a company called Apoject. They got half a billion dollars and their invention is one of these little blister packs of medicine that once they actually execute, this might be a phenomenal earth changing injection, but how they got the federal contracts to um, be the number one um, delivery system for the COVID vaccine is a rather concerning story. Um, and they continue to be making their factory and thinking that they are going to deliver even though they're not meeting their um, promises. So, because we're going quickly here, one thing that I think we all need to think about is, has enough time passed for researchers to understand the consequences of these medical supply shortages? And the answer to that is yes. At Harvard, there's a study that showed healthcare workers with inadequate PPE had a 30% greater chance of infection and Black, Hispanic, and Asian staffers had the highest risk of catching COVID-19. At UC Berkeley, they found that California healthcare workers without PPE were more likely to be infected at work. And in the Netherlands, they did this phenomenal study at three hospitals where they looked at the medical providers who did get COVID and found that the strains of COVID that they had were not the same ones they were exposed to at work. In other words, with proper masks, gloves, gowns, et cetera, they were able to not get COVID from their patients. And so I think it's really critical to point out that with proper PPE, our medical providers can be protected from this disease that they're trying to save people from. And without it, they will die. And um, that was kind of a, where we came to with our deadly shortages film of how medical supply chains collapsed and lives were lost. Um, so what now? The hospitals are still rationing medical N95 masks and they have stockpiles. We've, we've uh, actually surveyed hospitals around the United States. Their stockpiles of N95, for example, range from <clears throat> two months to 12 months. And um, I get a text every day from a N95 maker in Fort Worth who's now got seven, seven million N95 masks sitting in his trucks ready to go. And then I hang out with friends who are nurses and doctors as well as talking to procurement officers at, in our survey. And they are not providing these masks to their caregivers at the levels that they are designed to be provided, which is one per patient. That's the only way they've been tested. Um, so I'll stop the share screen, but um, what next? The injection rollout, the ongoing supply, I'm not gonna say shortages, but kind of um, imbalance. Um, and these, um, you know, I think for a lot of journalists in their communities, you should look at who, who through all of their savings, hired people started these makeshift gown, hand sanitizer, 3D printing swabs, all of that, and are now losing their shirts because the federal government is not gonna buy them up. Um, these American mask makers cannot get federal contracts right now because it's a little bit cheaper to get them from China or Mexico. So I'll stop there. Look forward to your questions and thanks everybody for being here. Okay, let me, just one real quick uh, question on technique. You mentioned the two data sources uh, you referred to, Import Genius and Tangiva. 
could you give us, uh, for the journalist out there, give us a brief sense of how those two differ and, and how complete how complete is the data? The, the data is um, very complete. They differ. One specific thing is that um, Pangeev is an easier, it's an easier platform to use. You can kind of very quickly say, I just want to know Chinese masks going to India or Indian masks going to Ecuador or COVID tests going to this place. So that one's a little quick and easy in terms of their platform. Import Genius is a company that will work with us more closely. So they will provide us an analyst and who will sit on the phone with me for a long time or work through a spreadsheet with me. And Pangeva does not do that type of support. Um, uh, and Import Genius has more countries available to us than, um, than Pangeva. Pangeva is much more US. They are both very nice and comprehensive and Chris, the, coolest thing about them is they're very up to date. I don't know if you researchers use them as well, but they're, you know, I can look at what came into the port of Los Angeles two days ago. Um, and so that makes it very timely for us as journalists to be able to say, well, these shipments just arrived. Okay. All right. So let's, um, let's go to some other questions. Um, and I have a question. Uh, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand and, and we will give the audio, uh, audio over to you, or you can submit a question in the text in the Q&A question and answer text function. Um, first question here is from Firdus al Farouk from, he, who is from uh, MedTech Insight. Um, and I'm just gonna throw this to <clears throat> all four of you. I'm not quite sure who, who, should, who should have a, maybe Meredith, if you could take first crack at this. The Biden administration, <clears throat> excuse me, the Biden administration has not rescinded the Trump administration's tariffs on China, uh, has been arguing national security reasons. Is the US basically using tariffs as a form of sanctions for China's human rights violations and national security threats? Will we ever see the tariffs lifted and how does that affect supply chains? That's a fairly broad question, but Meredith, do you have any general thoughts on that? I mean, I would say right now the administration is still getting itself organized to make what will be a very sensitive political decision for them. We don't have Catherine Tai, the U.S. Trade Representative, confirmed yet. Maybe that'll happen this week. But um, I think be, it will be so sensitive because there's a real kind of domestic consensus that uh, China is at times not playing fairly with us. So there's a lot of kind of just negative uh, 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 just negative thoughts about China. So I think you're not going to see them easily get rid of the tariffs. I think there'll be a negotiation involved, uh, maybe a second bilateral negotiation following on the one that Trump folks did. I do think the human rights things have infused people's perception. You can see it in Congress. A lot of bills have been introduced on the human rights problems. But really what you have is a very um, fluid policy situation that hasn't been able the, the administration just hasn't been able to get it managed yet because it's so early in the administration. Okay. Um, I mean, let me, let me, I, I've got a question for you, Meredith, and then for Fiona, talking about the executive orders that uh, the Trump administration put out and then the Biden administration put out. Uh, Meredith, could you tell us about the Trump administration's, his, his executive orders in August, you know, asking the federal government to purchase essential drugs and other related products solely from US manufacturers, told the FDA to compile a list of which medicines would be covered. Where does that review stand? And has the Biden administration undone that or is it still existing? I mean, I would characterize it as the Biden folks did not repeal that executive order. They basically added on to it. And the two executive orders that they put out in this uh, regard are to me, uh, hugely comprehensive of a million ish, I mean, probably 19 or 20 public policy issues that they are going to review. Uh, the first set is a, they pick five sectors and then they're going the second, and that's gonna be done in maybe a hundred days. And then they'll be doing another one that's much longer, but <clears throat> very detailed, uh, uh, probably, uh, asking businesses for information, looking at, at very individual supply chains for labor rights problems and environmental concerns and health policy concerns. And I almost, I mean, I was pretty, uh, 
I'm a little concerned because in this kind of, to go from having the government not do much picking of what a strategic product is to looking at supply chains across the entire economy with every issue under the sun considered, it just may be too much for the bureaucracy to get done. I mean, they may be able to, to manage the process. Um, I know they've got a lot of people working on it and supply chain coordinators at the White House, but they've set themselves up a very intimidating project and short timelines. Okay. And Fiona, you, know, you mentioned those Biden executive orders also. So could you give us a sense again uh, when, are, when are those supposed to be done? Well, I, as Meredith said, you've got a 100-day uh, look. The most recent one, you've got a 100-day look at uh, four products. Uh, turns into uh, a year-long review of six sectors. So it is very expansive in its ambition. I think, uh, I think Meredith is quite correct. You know, th there's a lot there. I think that's what's exciting and interesting about it. I don't... Um, uh, I don't think they can resolve it in that time frame, but but these both of the Biden executive orders uh, point towards the need for long term consistent strategic uh, reviews and re reviews. So this is about uh, resilience strategy that is ongoing and on a one time kick of the can. So I don't think this is going to be done and dusted uh, in the next sort of uh, year and a half. Obviously, um, this is. Um, but I think what's important is the is the direction of travel, um, which does involve um, a much. I mean, the U.S. has a very long tradition um, of uh, of active. Um, mixed economy, state uh, execution and organism, the entrepreneurial states, right? Mariana Mazzucato's uh, evocative phrase, uh, she speaks mostly about the US, which is sort of a hidden developmental state, but nonetheless a very entrepreneurial state that has coordinated and organized the, the, the generation of important industrial se sectors. I mean, the internet, uh, semiconductors, um, DARPA, these, uh, the, these kinds of uh, institutions that have uh, invested in and cultivated uh, an ecosystem of, of, of companies. Uh, and so it's a return to that um, in a more active and transparent way, and, in my view, um, but importantly, putting, uh, lining this up with the climate uh, agenda, lining this up with the labor standards, which are not just about China by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the known um, challenges in the medical supply chain are about surgical instruments from Pakistan and about forced labor in medical gloves from Malaysia. Um, so, so this is, these, you know, a lot of the globalized supply chain is about arbitrage uh, on environmental and labor standards. Uh, it's it, the efficiencies that are sought are, are, are on the backs of, of, of labor. So, so I think there's a, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's a direction of travel and, and we're seeing Europeans moving in this uh, direction as well. California has a modern slavery act. Australia has a modern slavery act. We're getting a modern slavery act. The UK has a modern, like there's a, a lot of these kinds of uh, movements that say our tri trade systems have to become fairer. And I do think the Biden reviews are moving in that direction. Okay. But Chris, no, the one thing, the one thing I wanted to just mention is that the, the administration's view is going at these other sectors in addition to medical devices. So it includes batteries and includes critical minerals and semiconductors. So this is a this is a very comprehensive review that goes way beyond the medical sector. Could, could I add something as well? Uh, I, I think there's a general lack of understanding of the complexity and the interdependency of these supply chains. So for example, uh, we still do manufacture some semiconductors in the Uni United States. So for example, Intel, of course, but also Samsung has a semiconductor fab and you know, NXP makes a lot of automotive parts in Austin, Texas and Arizona. But all of those parts, the raw wafers go to Malaysia, Vietnam, or China for testing and packaging before they come back, right? And, and people don't understand that. Same, same thing with critical minerals like uh, rare earths. We have a mine that is reopened in Mountain Pass, California, okay? But the ore has to go to China for processing before it comes back, okay? And oftentimes it comes back fabricated into neodymium magnets or so on. But one of the things I think you will find, especially if you probe congressional staffs and you know, uh, uh, offices in Washington is there is a general lack of understanding of the detail about how these things uh, are actually structured. Okay, so um, let me see. We have a question here. I'm going to hand the microphone over to uh, Bob Rohr, a um, freelance journalist. Um, uh, Jeff, you can give uh, Bob the microphone. Bob, can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, great. I have uh, two questions uh, for, for every, anyone, everyone. Um, most of the, the shortage in the productions and supply chains issues are, most of those products are single use throwaways, things like that. Are we seeing any change in thought to returning to things which can be recycled and reused, cleaned? Uh, we, we've seen some people doing this as uh, an emergency basis, but are we thinking more long-term about the entire life cycle cost of these throwaway items and, and switching to more sustainable things? That's question number one. Fiona, is that something you want to tackle? Sure. I mean, yes, I do think that there's, I mean, the CDC put out, um, this is partially what Martha's talking about, guidance for emergency use that allowed people to reuse these things for multiple patients, keep keep the PPE on for a shift. Um, so those are not the kinds of reuses uh, that we want to see going forward. But but certainly we've seen a lot of innovation and exploration of the question of, 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 of uh, masks or, or processes for sterilizing them, uh, products that can be uh, repurposed. Um, so I think these are part of, these are some of the productive conversations that have been created by this because the mountains of waste uh, that are piling up in hospitals from the enormous increased use of PPE are sort of, are really quite shocking uh, and unpleasant for, uh, for, uh, for most involved and, and very little of this, this really can't be recycled. So there's also explorations, not that recycling is your primary go-to for this kind of thing. Uh, recycling sort of at the bottom of the high hierarchy of things you wanna do from an environmental perspective, but nonetheless, there's exploration of, are there ways to, to recycle these products and are there ways to, to, to make reusables? And as you know, we've seen a, a, a major trajectory in medicine towards uh, single use uh, devices, single use products. And so I do think this is part of the push, slow but steady push, hopefully backwards uh, to products that can be uh, repurposed, um, remanufactured and reused. Okay, Bobby. I just wanted to add that, yeah, in the UK, 80% of hospital gowns were laundered or fabric and are, are sent to laundry. And in the United States, it was the opposite. It was like 20% pre-COVID. And so very specifically, fabric hospital gowns are an item that can be sent to laundry and some hospital systems under COVID are already doing that and have had to um, open massive laundromats just to deal with their gowns. Okay, okay. Um, the, the uh, second question is, uh, you, you talked about issues of some of the domestic suppliers who jumped in are now have product and no one is buying them because they're a little bit more expensive. Could you talk a little bit about what groups like Civica RX and, and some of the others are doing in terms of um, assigning long-term, generally five-year or more commitments to certain volumes with domestic suppliers and, and how widespread is that? Um, I, I mean, I can speak to Premier and um, uh, some, of the other, some of the other groups, GPOs have made commitments long-term to these domestic suppliers and have invested in them and it's still not enough. And Bob, I guess I, I may have misspoke because I think I did say it's a little cheaper from Mexico or China, but they're trying, the domestic suppliers are trying to meet those same import prices um, and are coming close. But the, um, and even with investment from these GPOs, and even with commitment from the GPOs, it's still not enough. They still are in that exact same situation they were after H1N1 when they ramped up, they hired, they built up their lines, and then the demand disappeared and they, um, you know, literally lost their own savings. That contrasts markedly with the billions that have gone into advanced uh, purchase agreements for the vaccines where um, two very profitable pharmaceutical companies have been provided with billions and that's important. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of baffling why a similar uh, program of support for um, smaller companies is, is not, it's not viable, it would seem to be. Okay. Can I, I add to that sure. as well? Uh, I mean, I think one of the problems you see uh, for these manufacturers is, uh, you know, like capacity utilization. I, I was testifying to a congressional committee last summer about the shortage of N95 masks. And I said, well, you know, how much surge capacity did you want to have? Uh, 
uh, and demand certainly rose more than a factor of 20. But I said, let's say, for example, I suddenly needed to produce 20, uh, 20 X more, that meant during normal times, I would be running my factory at 5% utilization. Okay. And wall street would be all over my case. If I was running a factory at 5% utilization, right? So what domestic manufacturers, and I just talked to one of these companies that, uh, uh, took their own capital and started making N95 masks. And, and what they need is they need stable demand, right? Stable demand over, uh, an extended period of time. The other interesting insight he gave me is uh, th they uh, took close to four months to get NIOSH approval for their N95 mask. Okay, and I look at you know how long did it take to get emergency use uh, authorization for these vaccines? Uh, well, you know, less than a week in some cases. All right, what's so hard about getting NIOSH approval for? Uh, in N95 mask. And one of the things he said that was very interesting is there's been no innovation in N95 masks, right? So the approval process has been very routinized and uh, the uh, NIOSH would, it's easier for purchasing agents to just go with an established supplier and buy that rather than take any risk with new, new suppliers, right? So it makes it very hard for these entrepreneurs who have thrown their own money in uh, to try to meet a national need. Okay, so let's go to it's. Um, it is a uh, ten fifty five. Uh, we'll go a little. We'll go a little bit past eleven. Um, we'll try to get get a handful more questions in. Um, let's go to uh, Joyce. Joyce uh, Friedan from MedPage today. Uh, Joyce, you can have the microphone for your question. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear? Uh, we did, then we lost you. So, uh, Jeff, can you unfreeze your mic? Yes. How about now? Okay, now we can, yes. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, Meredith and any of the other panelists, can, can you talk more about the necessity of having international partners in the supply chain? Because it seems like it could be difficult to convince the public and some members of Congress that we can't or shouldn't just rely on US suppliers and people might be nervous that if there is a shortage, other countries will focus on supplying their own needs first. Um, well, I think you're right. There is a, a political issue there. I think, um, Realistically, uh, so many, particularly in the pharmaceutical area, there is you know so much complexity in how we are innovating on vaccines and so forth. It's very much a globalized international process that requires, uh, as in the Pfizer case, required an international partner to actually get their vaccine up and running. Um, so it, as as Willie said, I mean I don't think the complexity of what it takes to produce some of the, these products in a modern economy is fully appreciated. Um, and I think part of this is gonna be an educational process on the Hill. I think you see the finance committee <clears throat> having some hearings <clears throat> this week on all different issues related to supply chains, incentives that would, would allow companies to think about reshoring, um, but not be a, uh, a stick to do it. I mean, I'm not sure what's in that hearing, but I think that'll be one of the things that's considered. And then. Um, they're going to have another hearing on human rights, I think, in supply chains. So we're, I think, at the tip of a lot of education that's going to be done before a policy can be written that would actually get to the goal, goal of making the U.S. more secure. <clears throat> I, I don't think I have much to add to that other than to say that it's taken 20 odd years to get to the point that we're in of these incredibly complicated, multi-tier, globalized supply networks that Willie described so well moving one material from here for raw processing and back. It's, it's going to take decades uh, on, on some of these issues to, to reverse that. Um, so I don't, uh, uh, I don't think there's another way around that. And I, you're not going to get, again, you're not going to get to autarky. I think it's about uh, a more, a more a fair approach to trade, uh, a more explicitly managed approach to trade. Um, and I would hope that it's also, we'll move away from what we're currently seeing, which is, um, uh, rich countries increasingly thinking about how they can become more secure, but holding on to institutions um, that are making the developing world insecure. 
so I think we need to, we need a, we need a, uh, if we want free, you know, WTO is a good example of the, the lack of freeness in our free trade agreements. Um, so, uh, so I, but I think it's going to take a while. Joyce, you had a question in the chat from Martha. Do you still want to ask that one? Yes. Uh, so Martha, I, I just, it was a technical question just about, uh, you mentioned the ear loops on one of the counterfeit products. And I was confused about that. Was that, was there something about the ear loops that people knew was counterfeit? Um, <clears throat> almost all NIOSH approved N95 masks have a um, head loop instead. And it's a little bit more expensive to attach the straps because they need to be more secure because that head loop is gonna be a tighter fit. And so I actually have my box here of my N95s. When it's a, like this is a counterfeit, it says, N95, but it's got this ear loop that you're not typically going to find an ear loop on any N95. Um, and so that is a red flag. Um, and I just, I wanted to mention, I think we've all kind of breezed over that there's labor abuses in the Malaysian glove manufacturing and the Pakistani medical device, but I just want to take 30 seconds and explain what that means. Those are Malaysian glove Factories making latex gloves is an environmentally um, uh, damaging and concerning issue because where is this nitrile or latex or rubber coming from and who is harvesting it? So the raw materials are um, you know, devastating forests. And then the people who make the gloves in these expensive factories that have, are much harder to stand up even than an N95 factory, are often from Nepal or Bangladesh. They pay their entire family fortune in recruiter fees to go to Malaysia for a job to make the gloves. And they um, are locked in their dormitories. They've had massive COVID outbreaks. They get shipped home in coffins because they die on these jobs. The work is hot. Um, they actually have major um, uh, accidents at these factories with um, amputations of different parts of their bodies. Um, and they are often not paid what they were promised to be paid. So I, I don't want to gloss over that. It's, it's very grave. And here in the United States, we're just whipping these you know, gloves out of these boxes, snapping them on, everybody getting a vaccine all day long. And there's a cost to that. Thank you. Um, all right, so we have time for just a, a couple more questions. I have a, a chat question here from Bob Ferrari, who is exec, executive editor of Supply Chain Matters. With all these current insights on PPE and pharmacy supply network performance, how will this be inputted into Biden's strategic supply chain analysis effort? Um, I mean, I guess I, my view is that the White House is studying everything that's out there to, to come up with solutions. So I would hope, you know, we've, we've done some meeting with, uh, with them on our work, and I'm sure the other panelists have as well. Um, so it will be fed in through the interagency process and, and the staff folks that are charged with what, writing this analysis and these reports. Is that what he meant? I think so, yes. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, this is a question for Fiona. Uh, this is from Andrew Green, a freelancer in Germany who, and a former NPF fellow. For Fiona, I'm wondering if you think there's any possibility that TRIPS waiver might be adopted, and if not, is there any emergence? Are there any emerging emerging compromises? TRIPS waiver. Well, I mean, I think the TRIPS so waiver, sure you know. which is what was pushed for by uh, India and South Africa, it's signed on um, by you know 58, I think, countries at this point. So it's very much a developing world versus a rich world. It's being blocked or basically refusing to seriously consider it at the WTO by by uh, Canada is, is equivocating, Australia, Europe, Switzerland, et cetera. And the US, there was hope that Biden might uh, um, push forward with a new vision on this. And I, I, think the, I think the political question remains open. It really does depend on, on public awareness uh, and political advocacy to put pressure on, on richer countries on this one. Um, meanwhile, I, I think the WHO is continuing to work through the COVAX, the COVAX mechanism, which is really about donating funds and donating doses. And it looks like they're trying to encourage um, perhaps uh, in encourage more distributed regionally, globally distributed manufacturing also through the COVAX um, vehicle. And, and they're working on vaccine fairness as a whole kind of political agenda. So um, 
you know, it, it's kind of shocking post Doha that in the context of a massive crisis like this, that, that, it, that the waiver would not go through as, 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 uh, uh, as WHO has said, if not now, when would you actually suspend these, these rules temporarily? Um, but uh, I think it's a political question. So maybe the journalists will make this a bigger issue and there'll be a groundswell of public attention to this and the new administration in the US will, uh, will go in a different direction. And just uh, for background, uh, what does TRIPS stand for? Trade related intellectual property. So this is under the WTO. So these the regime, particularly we think about patents, the 20 year uh, protection on, on patents. Um, but the waiver is therefore a sort of a fairly comprehensive temporary um, non-enforcement of those rules of those patent protections uh, that would exist for the vaccines, but also other uh, other forms of, of, of knowledge, the, the, the trade secrets that you would need to actually manufacture these things, the cell lines that you would need to actually produce the, the vaccine. So it's it's a comprehensive waiver proposal uh, that would be in existence till there's herd immunity globally as, as identified by the WHO. And so the WHO is behind this, uh, developing countries are behind this, but it's, it's being stalled um, um, at the WTO. It's really not being taken forward. Um, okay. And I think we're just gonna have time for one more question and then we're gonna draw this to a close. This is something we've, we've, we've touched on earlier, but haven't really gotten into much depth on, but that's the, the dominance of China on active pharmaceutical ingredients. I know, uh, Willie, this is something you've looked at, and I'm sure Meredith and, and um, Fiona have as well, but why is it that, you know, why is it that, that China dominates API and why aren't, you know, why isn't the United States making more of these and, or, or other countries making more of these active pharmaceutical ingredients? And has it become a it, was a, it was a big concern a year ago, people were speculating that this could become a problem for us. Has it, has anything really changed in the last year? Well, so let me uh, tell you some digging that I have done. I've talked to some Indian pharma companies because Indian pharma companies uh, used to make a lot of their APIs themselves. Okay, and it, especially if you go in the region around Hyderabad, uh, there's a lot of pharma companies. They make a lot of things like uh, uh, acet uh, acetaminophen. You know, uh, I actually brought students to visit the factory there uh, where they said, wait a minute, I thought this all came from New Jersey. Okay, now, uh, uh, you know, they, they happen to make 18 billion tablets a year in that one factory. Okay, but they used to do all of that, but then they really were forced out of the market by China. Okay, and what China decided is that this was a strategic industry. So if you look at, and I, I've looked at a number of compounds, like uh, I was looking at uh, one of these steroid precursors that's used in most steroid drugs. Okay, and there'd be like three manufacturers in the US and one in Europe and 200 plus in China. And when China decides that something is strategic, what happens is a lot of local governments get behind it and they will uh, subsidize extensively. And so what the Indian manufacturer told me is that they could not compete unless they sourced their APIs from Chinese manufacturers because they were lower costs, okay? And uh, uh, so now uh, back in March, one year ago, uh, what happened is, uh, especially when the Wuhan area shut down, there are a lot of API manufacturers there and they, uh, they had short, faced shortages for these APIs in India. That's when Modi uh, banned the export of 22 uh, key, you know, commodity uh, generic pharmaceuticals out of India, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of it gets down to uh, kind of cutthroat competition in China among uh, heavily subsidized firms who can therefore produce at lower cost. Now, I've also talked to an American manufacturer who's trying to reshore some of this manufacturing of you know generics back in the U.S. and he was complaining it's like his profit is a couple of cents per per dose and it's like what do you expect me to do? Uh, you know, especially with the pressure on healthcare costs, we're not willing to pay for the premium uh, for kind of uh, supply security and that just goes down the whole chain and then it becomes a race to the bottom. That that that's sort of my view and uh, as I dig around it. Okay. Well, I would agree with that. I, I think there's probably 
an area where we could have some more visibility in the supply chain because when you look at the trade statistics overall it's very difficult to see where the api is being made because it, it could be supplying a, a european company or an indian company um, and it's probably helpful to know uh, what they're relying on and where the source of supply is yeah. I should add, I, I looked at that question as well, right? I even went to the FDA and looked at all the, the filings on these documents. And one of the things that makes it very difficult to trace the supply chain is confidentiality, okay? And I talked to one of the big pharma companies, actually it was a pharma conference on uh, supply, chain <laughs> supply chain security, and they admitted that they can't see past their first tier, right? Because their first tier supplier in China in particular, does not want to disclose its suppliers for fear of disintermediation, right? So confidentiality agreements protect a lot of those different layers from visibility. So it becomes very hard. Uh, I, I mean, I was stymied when I was uh, working on these sources in China. Nobody would talk to me unless I was willing to offer payoffs, which I wasn't willing to do. Okay. All right. And with that, I think we need to draw this to a close. I want to thank all four speakers, Meredith uh, Broadbent, Fiona Miller, Arthur Mendoza, and Willie Shi for coming on and explaining, um, explaining the supply chain dy dynamics for us. Uh, Martha, I want to thank you up here on the West Coast. So you got up very early to come on. So thank you. Um, and uh, for all of our viewers out there, we will have content and resources from this program, including links to all the reports that these speakers have been talking about or have contributed to as well as data sources. And I'll add in those data sources that uh, Martha was talking about specifically. We'll have all those on our website by the end of today or tomorrow. We will be continuing this series on global trade issues. So watch nationalpress.org so you can see what our next program will be in a couple of weeks. And with that, I wanna thank the speakers again and thank all the viewers for coming on and for asking such good questions. And uh, that's it for today, but we'll see you online soon. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Nice to meet you all. All right. Thank you very much.